Greetings, friends. It's Chapo back once again on this Monday, January 22nd. It's uh, me, Amber, and Chris today. And I would just like to kick off today's episode. I have one thing to say, and that's this. Listen, you can't have the fucking infinity fucking bees and beekeeping. I'm gonna come, I'll, I'll have a bit of that right up right. oh, the apples and bears. It's the fucking beekeeper. Oh, I'm back again. Yes, we, <laughs> yes, I, I would eventually like to talk about the beekeeper, the, the bees. There's, there's a lot going on in the world, but and, and chief among them, we got to protect the hive. Yeah, we have, <laughs> protecting the hive is more important today than it's ever been, especially in an election year. It's but, really what this election comes down to. Who's going to protect the hive? And um, uh, what, what, but what happens when the hive has a queen that's producing deficient offspring? Yes, that's when you call in a beekeeper, love. I'll sort it right out. I'll sort it right out. <laughs> so I have a, a thoughts about that. But look, there there is an election going on. We got the New Hampshire primary coming up uh, tomorrow. Iowa caucus over, but we, I, I want to begin today's show by acknowledging the end of Ron DeSanctimonious, help me Rhonda, Meatball Ron, <laughs> Rob DeSantis, whatever you want to call him, the DeSantis campaign is no more. And I guess I would like to sort of pause at this sort of melancholy and bittersweet moment <laughs> because this truly does mark the end of all fun in this presidential election, the end of anything funny happening in this presidential like right now the only conceivable thing that would like re-engage me in this present presidential election is if either trump or biden drop dead that <laughs> would be and then things would go from zero to 100 <laughs> yes yeah but you know we've we've covered we've covered we've covered rob's campaign and I, I i would be remiss if i didn't mention the nbc news obit on the desantis campaign has some <laughs> Incredible gems in it. And the headline here is a total failure to launch. Why Ron DeSantis <laughs> was doomed from the start. Muddled messages, hiring too many staffers, and even a puzzle. How it all went wrong for the DeSantis presidential bid. The puzzle is a weird addition because I was just sort of like, you know what? I'm glad they got something to unwind with. Yeah, it's a perfect surrealist cap to this whole thing. Before we start off with this, I am actually I'm coming to you guys from the... Uh, the People's Republic of Vermont, right next to uh, New Hampshire, where the you right know, next the psychos- to failed state, failed yeah, state, New Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire, where the you know the the, the psychotropic energy of the of, of a primary radiates through. And I have to tell you, I actually had a dream last night uh, about Ron DeSantis's um, campaign collapsing, in which I was trying to infiltrate the rapidly deteriorating uh, Ron DeSantis headquarters, asking them if I can take any of their recording equipment. Uh, for my own. <laughs> it was like when uh, Tony like, Wilson closed this anymore, the Hacienda. Right? Office equipment, computers, musical equipment, take it all, use it wisely, let a thousand Mancunians bloom. Good night, God bless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> In my head, I thought, it was kind of a, I thought it was, I thought you were going to say you were having sort of like an administrative anxiety thing where you're like, you guys have to get your shit together and you're trying to like yes. coordinate their work. You were just going to producer brain. Yeah, I, I I think it would surprise nobody that that's what a lot of my dreams are like is like sending emails <laughs> and organizing like and like sorting wires and stuff. But this one happened to be uh, you know sifting through the sinking ship of the uh, the the Desantis headquarters as the you know the boxes were being moved up and the chairs were being put on top of desks looking for uh, you know yeah. microphones and Zoom H sixes. Get that get that copper wiring. What else is it? Yeah. He's not using it. Let us not forget dreams are messages from the deep. <laughs> and and I mean like and, and and Ron he he will he will he will sleep perchance to dream, or the cousin death. But okay, so here here <laughs> here 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 is here is like this incredible NBC because like I feel like this is this is such a a perfect capstone to like the the doomed Ron DeSantis presidential campaign, and it really is funny thinking back to like eight nine months ago when like everyone in the mainstream media was like it's time to start taking Ron DeSantis seriously. <laughs> why Ron DeSantis is no joke. Why Ron DeSantis could be the end of Donald Trump. And it was just mm-hmm. like, I mean, I, I guess like I, I, I bought into it for a second because I was just like, hmm, I, I guess I bought into the idea that like, hmm, this is Donald Trump, but he's serious. But like, I, I guess that I was dis- disabused of that immediately as soon as I, I mean, when he, like, when he won that Florida election by such a huge margin, it was like, OK, yeah, there's like something winning here. Broward County. Yeah. 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 See, I feel like Florida's winning Florida's a point against you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're learning that. 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, it, it just what should have been evident from the beginning is that like th- this was the worst decision of his life to to <laughs> run for president now and not wait till four years from from in the future when it would have been an open field. But Trump has got this thing sewed up. But it didn't help that Ron DeSantis' campaign was a, a complete a complete factory of chuckleheads and bozos <laughs> and, and and puzzle and it's a, literally a puzzle palace. So listen to this. <laughs> It's okay. This is this is this is this is like somewhere. This is on the eve of the Iowa caucus, in which DeSantis and his campaign basically put all of their chips. They went all in on Iowa and its evangelical vote, and like the rural parts of like they they put everything into Iowa. And now this is a report uh, from NBC in like the days leading up to the actual Iowa caucus. Quote. But in the week before the all-important caucuses, Scott Wagner, the recently installed head of the Super PAC, was doing something that aides found puzzling. He was literally (laughs) doing a puzzle. In the headquarters of Never Back Down in West Des Moines, Iowa, (laughs) Wagner was, according to some of his staff, spending a significant amount of time in the precious final few days constructing a peaceful 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle puzzle of a landscape. Did you guys find out? uh, Did you guys look it up? Because I immediately looked it up. Okay, well, what is what, the landscape? What the actual okay, design so was? Spring, Springbok, I, I, can, I can put it in the, in the chat if you like, but uh, it's called Moon Cabin Retreat. Um, <laughs> it's, this there's is- a lot going on with the, like, the, you see the northern lights and there's kind of, there's a dog on the end of the dock and I'm, I'm going to send is- it to you. But I looked for it, I'm like, well, now I want to I buy this. But then I mean, yeah, it, this instantly has to become one of the Target. most... Yeah, oh, this oh, wow. has to become one of the most iconic puzzles of all time, right? Yeah, yeah. I know, and, I, and I like it because it's it's it's, it's just like he 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 didn't win a single county in Iowa. He finished like twenty percent. Uh, he finished thirty points behind Trump. And the image of like peaceful cabin in moonlight is, I imagine, what they show you in like a Swedish euthanasia pod right before they gas <laughs> right. you or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit the, the imagery of it because there's a canoe. It's not quite the Rhine gives its gold to the sea sort of like German <laughs> romanticism, but it's kind of like the corny American version of that. Like it definitely feels, it definitely feels American. It definitely feels very Thomas Kincaid. Yeah, trying yeah, yeah. To I was going to say the Ubermensch, the, the the painter of light, and I wouldn't be surprised if that is a Thomas Kincaid painting. But uh, so it's, it goes on. It says in a photo taken on January 9th, shared by with NBC News by Never Back Down team member, others in the room were hunched over their laptops, and the photo that accompanies this. We should really make this the the, the image yeah. of the uh, the show <laughs> or the moon the cabin photo. retreat. Yeah, Come just on. the moon cabin itself. I might I well, might do that. Okay, well the photo itself is great. Because, like, yeah, indeed, you see two staffers on their laptops, you know, probably grinding away, you know, uh, trying to doing get organized the calls. Yeah, we've doing all done the calls. Those, yeah. And then this guy, Scott Wagner, the thousand piece puzzle has basically taken up about three tables worth of space <laughs> in the headquarters of their Iowa campaign. And uh, but it gets better. Um, Because it goes on, it says staffers are putting their dedication and devotion to electing Governor DeSantis and they come in here and then the CEO, the chairman of the organization is sitting there working on a puzzle for hours Said a never back down staffer who was there. Another another never back down staffer also said Wagner worked on it for hours in the week before Iowa. Here's my favorite part. In a comment to NBC News, Wagner noted that the office puzzle was there when we arrived and became a sense of pride for the entire team and everyone chipped in for a few minutes to get it done. Okay, so when he said... The office puzzle was there (laughs) before before we arrived. It will be there after we leave. The office puzzle is forever. You've always been the caretaker here, Mr. DeSantis. I feel like it got wrapped up with their sense of... I feel like it was more of a Fitzcarraldo style, like kind of obsessive thing. (laughs) <laughs> no, I think like, you know, like, because every four years, like a lot of office space gets rented out in Iowa as these campaigns move in and, you know, things that used to be shoe stores get, you know, handed over to the, you know, Nikki Haley campaign or whatever. But in Iowa, you got to have a puzzle. You got to have a puzzle in the office. The, pu- the puzzle's always been there. And of course, before man this- existed, the moon cabin <laughs> retreat waited for him. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect puzzle waiting for the perfect puzzle <laughs> practitioner. Wow. But of course, uh, the, 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 the idea that like this asshole was doing a puzzle that was already there instead, you know, the, knowing full well that Ron DeSantis was cooked. And that's the other thing, like the never back down staffer is getting like upset that he wasn't like giving it his all or whatever. 
come on, everybody there knew yeah. it was toast. It also, was done. Never it's, it's, back down is literally like what you say before the firing squad executes you. Like it's it's yes. it's a it's For, what a, you say before you back down. Pers- yeah, it's a defeated <laughs> person's like. Yeah, I'm never gonna back down. I, I'm definitely losing, but I'm gonna take yes. this lose. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish the race. You really do have to think about what the headline is going to be when you concede the election, when you name your pack. It's like entering, entering the Iowa caucuses. We've just registered. Won't concede election pack. <laughs> 15 months later, won't concede election pack concedes but, election. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I just the, the puzzle detail gave me that gave me that old time feeling. It gave me that old time feeling. And of course, it immediately conjured, uh, you know, like you've always been the caretaker here, Mr. DeSantis. It immediately, uh, Brendan and I just started texting, texting to each other, just doing, go, go, like, uh, sorry, he's got to share with Brendan here. He says, DeSantis berating some uh, volunteer going, did you ever once think about my responsibilities to finish this puzzle? <laughs> give, give me the puzzle, Wendy. Give yeah. me the puzzle. Did you know, Mr. DeSantis, that your son is attempting to bring an outside party into this situation? <laughs> Did you know that? A former UN ambassador, a woman. <laughs> a woman? And then finally, the last image I had of the DeSantis, DeSantis puzzle overlook hotel meltdown was, of course, the elevators to the DeSantis office opening and pudding spilling out. Just the sea of pudding. <laughs> there we go. I, I do have to say, just at a, you know, I, I tend to think highly of people in the whole. If you give them half a chance, they're pretty good. But like, the fact that they just completely overestimated like being able to win on a culture war. And it's like people were just like, yeah, that's not a lot of there there. And I think even the right now assumes that people are more bigoted than they are materially interested. And like, DeSantis is never going to give like a, you know, a speech like Trump's like barn burner at the, at the train unions, trade unions consortium or whatever. He's just going to talk about bathrooms and shit. Yeah. And it's like the, Trump takes up so much like has the charisma to push so much of that wacky culture war stuff so far. I think, you know, the, the one of the main themes of the DeSantis campaign was that the the remaining margin of culture war shit that they were picking up was exclusively nerd shit. Yeah. Exclusively for like the the deeply online uh uh people who make it their business to research the furthest edges of the culture war, as of course to the illustrated by of anything. And, else. Yes. That you would this the type of stuff that you have to go to like bigot school to learn. Yeah, yeah. you don't just he's, like he's pick a bigot up. grad <laughs> student at least. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That you don't Absolutely just like pick up from the miasma. Or, yeah, no, as, and Trump as, moves on from it. He just he's yeah. just like okay, now I'm going to do some jokes. Like he doesn't it's fixate because, on it. Oh, I mean, honestly, weirdo. now I'm it's like, time for it, the roast. <laughs> this is not to say like the uh, the effects of it aren't serious, but the thing yeah. is like the way Trump engages with the culture war is so successful because he doesn't take any of it serious. Yeah, <laughs> he, he like it is literally all funny to him, and like and that's why he can contradict himself and go back and be like Caitlyn, Caitlyn, I talked to Caitlyn Jenner, she's beautiful by the way, she can use any bathroom she wants, Caitlyn, <laughs> and any, anywhere you go in Mar a Lago yeah, is fine with me. Most people don't care about even right wingers don't care about it that much anyway. It's no. more just sort of a fly in the ointment. Yeah, and it's it's a. Uh, the the where it's most successful is the stuff that like just resonates at the gut level that you don't have to like think about too much or do too many like equations about yeah uh, and of course I mean I tweeted about this yesterday but I'll, like uh, this was all exemplified by my like I think everybody has their own personal favorite moment of disaster of the DeSantis campaign but mine of course was the uh, the bizarre groiperfied Nazi video that yeah. his his like <laughs> shadow campaign of like the actual like groipers put out yeah. on his behalf. That was the just absolute like most reliable and capable people you can possibly imagine. Yeah, his 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 like Waffen SS put put together like the most internetified thing as possible. And that I mean, again, like there are so many moments you can point out, but that one's the one for me of being like, oh, this is the this is the nerd shit. This is not the stuff that's to, ever going to resonate with deep with deep, mainstream. deep internet. It's like buried in, in it's blue waffle SS. It's there's nothing. <laughs> You have to be such so buried in online for so yeah. long. Yeah. Uh, Chris, for, for me, it was when he announced his campaign with a Twitter space and it yeah, immediately crashed. Was... And it was just Elon, it was Elon <laughs> Musk and that David Sack ball sack guy just talking over him for what seemed like 20 minutes. And, uh, then, and then, of course, Trump the had a, a, an amazing like a, the fact that the Trump campaign could put out a technically competent technological parody video on all social platforms within an, like that was a level of competent 
real time social media response yeah. that I've almost never seen from the Trump campaign that their parody video where like Satan and Hitler were in the Twitter space or whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then uh, of course, just, uh, just roasted, just completely and thoroughly roasted. Uh, this is this is one former never back down advisor told NBC News when they decided to do the Twitter Spaces launch. Maybe at that point, I knew they were stupid. And there are some <laughs> other there are some other great details from this. Uh, it says here uh, the campaign's top brass, including then campaign manager Janera Peck, top Ryan uh, top advisor Ryan Tyson, and Christina Pushaw, who were the who was the architect of DeSantis' communications strategy. Okay, so she's to blame for this. Good to know. Yeah. Um, held a conference call with those tapped to be the social media knife fighters on DeSantis's behalf. See, once again, like the, the so idea that your staff is trying to get brought a knife to a gunfight, <laughs> <laughs> just like a WAP, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it says it goes here. The group of roughly a dozen influencers was informally dubbed the Fight Club by the campaign. <laughs> They were willing to combat members of the media and DeSantis political foes. But from the very early weeks of the campaign, many were flummoxed by leadership's direction or lack thereof. The conference call was a shit show, just an absolute shit show, said a former Fight Club member who was on the call. Well, first of all, it was a shit show because you're talking about it. You're talking. Yes. About it. Yeah. You're yeah. breaking the first two yeah. rules yeah. <laughs> of shit show. <laughs> it's a p- people. Uh, people were pressed on the message and especially after the failed rollout, they had no answers. Now, this next thing I have to share because a teacher is really like a guy who we've been talking about on Chapa since 2016. During a particularly bizarre portion of the meeting, Bill Mitchell, a DeSantis mm. supporter with a large social media following, asked the top DeSantis campaign staff if they could call Musk because he was concerned that the site was limiting the visibility of his posts, a practice <laughs> commonly referred to as shadow banning. Shadow banning. Yep. Oh. So yeah, they, they had their top knife fighter, Bill Mitchell, was on the con- the Flight Club conference call, just trying to get the campaign to complain to Elon Musk that his posts aren't getting the engagement that they once did. He's getting ratioed, and damn it, he's not going to stand for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like I, I got to say, like it, it's been it's been painful for me to see Bill Mitchell give his all to the DeSantis mm-hmm. campaign and have them really shit all over him. You know, because like they don't deserve to have a true warrior. A warrior, like, no, yes. yeah, no. like a yeah, true poster. Like Ubrung, yeah, you know. Yeah. Did you see he was doing uh like this is the the kind of this is how Bernie could yep. still win yep. stuff from like yep. late March yesterday. He's like, okay, yeah, so yeah. the campaign is not dissolved; it is merely suspended. Now, if no, Trump is saying, actually like, Trump, if Trump is indicted, if Trump is gonna get sent to prison in the next six months, that will activate the Ron protocol. That will act- activate <laughs> a meatball protocol. And then and then and then Bill Mitchell was just saying, I'm assuming Ron DeSantis is going to be Trump's VP, and that's why I will be supporting Donald Trump. I, I mean, I don't know if he said he would support Donald Trump because Bill has gone very hard against. Donald, but I mean Ron, Ron just endorsed Ron D- Donald. So yeah, I, I mean like where they got nowhere to go. It's it's Trump or Ron no one. Donald. Yeah, Ron Donald. Ron Donald. Yeah, it's. I mean, getting back to how depressing it is. I mean, the other thing I've been thinking about is now that the primaries are effectively over, is like how you are the the the. the Add on way you can tell that the primaries are truly over is how much it has shifted into hysterical pre blaming the quote unquote left for Biden's presumed failure online like that 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 oh, yeah. discourse really ratcheted up literally the moment that Iowa happened and it was like all right this is over it's like all right now we're already getting into what was what should be like fourth quarter discussion about the election you know mm-hmm. yeah no i mean i i've noticed like i mean obviously because like as i said last episode everything's so on rails and we already know who the nominees are going to be it's going to be trump and biden again so we've seen like i think like earlier than usual in an election cycle like the the you know obsessive hectoring of people and sort of like uh attempts to scold and discipline people back into voting for biden and just be like because you know trump uh, you know it's gonna be the last election we ever have and to this, like, and I, I've noticed a lot of it lately, and I guess, like, to, to speak on that for a second, I would just like to say, for someone like me to say that I'm not going to vote for Biden in 2020, I didn't vote for, I mean, no, I'm sorry, in 2024, I didn't vote for him in 2020, and I wasn't planning to do it again this time before mm-hmm. he started murdering thousands of people. So i very unlikely that I'm going to be moved again now. But when I say this, people interpret it like it's a threat. Like I'm threatening the Democratic Party, like, oh, like you yeah. better get in line and vote and do what I want you to do or else, you know, like I'm not going to vote for you still. And, you know, like I understand like that's a hollow threat because I wasn't going to vote for them in the first place. So when I say I didn't vote for Biden in 2020 and I don't plan to do it again in 2024, it's not a threat. This isn't strategic. I'm bragging. 
I yeah. am bragging that I made the correct choice in 2020 and will continue to make the morally correct, the morally, politically, strategically correct choice in 2024. I don't think it'll affect the election one way or the other. I'm just, you yeah, know, I mean, saying we, where I'm we, at. We get to make these choices on easy mode because we live in New York and California where our personal contribu- contribution to the par- uh, the project is basically non-existent you know we, we, it, it is it is an aside to the discussion and we also but again, it's live like, in the most like republican democrat states yeah like and like they're the most right-wing democrats because they're so fucking big and wealthy like it yeah. doesn't we are the target like biden states and like like democrats in republican states are usually to the left of California yeah. and and New York Democrats. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm sympathetic to to people who I don't know that if you, I'm sympathetic to people who live in swing states or closed states to to have different at least different calculuses of how you might might yeah. make your decision to vote for Biden or not. But for us, for here in California and New York, it seems easy at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, and like I'll say I'll say like I did I said in 2020, I'm not the fucking voting police. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm not, mm-hmm. your, I'm not your parents. Like you can you can yeah. you can make that choice for yourself. I'm just simply saying, if I didn't vote for Joe Biden in 2020, if you think I'm gonna even come close to pulling the lever for that asshole now, you're out of your mind. But again, like you don't want my vote, and my vote doesn't matter in the first place. So all the people who it's just the anger people feel at like I don't know, some, well, some supposedly restive of, left. Yeah. It's supposed to be the premise of voting is that you're not supposed to bully someone into voting for this or that person. Yeah, you should like, be making your case and hoping you bring the them over. Yeah, and if you don't win, if you don't get my vote, sorry, loser. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the reason I brought this up in general is that you can tell and it's like palpable that it is coming on so quickly because of the acute panic that uh, the people in the position to do these the hectoring, the liberal hectoring, are feeling this they early on. They've been sitting on their hands, from what I can tell. <sighs> like, the Democratic Party appears to have not been particularly... Like, I haven't seen any fucking signs anywhere. And it doesn't even matter if you think there's no, like, contest or anything. They, they seem to have been like... You know, they got to Iowa and they're like, oh, shit, it's, I'm having a little deja vu where they just assumed their candidate... Was gonna yeah, they win. Didn't have, yeah, they didn't have to do anything to to ramp up like a primary uh, defense to like you know defend Bri- uh, Brandon. <laughs> what, what <laughs> Brandon in a while to defend yeah. Brandon against uh, a, you know a primary attack. So they just have so they and in a critical period where he's making a lot of decisions that are really pissing a lot of people off and rightly so. So it's like they're moving into this general election without even doing their warm ups. Yeah, and and without any se- like look as Josh Enger points out all the time. Uh, the Biden webpage does not even have an issues page right now. Oh there is a, no platform for the Democratic Party. There's no top down coordination, which makes all the people online go insane because they each feel like they're their own freelancing election coordinator with no direction from management, you know? And so it, yeah, everybody who cares about this stuff feels like they have to go out and be their own little like uh, door knocking boss on their neighbor's tweets. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought an example of this last week. It was like it was some post that someone made that got like, defaced by one of those community notes that wasn't really pointing out anything like factually inaccurate. It was just complaining about the sentiment expressed in the post, which was like, I think it was a trans woman in Florida who was saying that like, since, oh, yes. Biden's, since Biden's become president, like X, Y, or Z things have happened to like, you know, uh, d- d- deface or abridge my rights um, in the state of Florida. And he didn't do anything to stop that. And of course, like everyone was screaming at this person because, oh, it's the federal government. This is all done by Ron DeSantis and the state. Re- and like, the point that that person was making, though, was that like now is the time to organize like, you know, at a local level. I mean, I think they were like, of course, acknowledging that Biden didn't, you know, uh, legislate against trans people in the state of Florida. But like the point is, if the president can't help you, then what the fuck is like, what, what do I owe them? What is the incentive? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the point is usually so th- just so that it doesn't get worse. but. You know, it's an election year. I think people have the right to expect a positive case, you know? Yeah, and I also, I don't know how many, I mean, again, I I do think the infrastructure bill is great, but they're not even taking credit for it. And it does make you wonder, like I have wondered before, like, I don't know, Trump was pretty good for their fundraising, like not to be conspiratorial. Maybe they just don't, like maybe the top brass at least just don't really care if he wins. The online army yeah. certainly cares, but like, <laughs> the fight club. But like the fight you know, you club. brought up the infrastructure, infrastructure bill, and I think that there are things that that it would be possible. Again, I'm, I'm I'm trying to play devil's advocate about like if they could even make a positive case here, but the fact that there is 
no ability to make any kind of positive case whatsoever or seemingly any no. attempt to is a demonstration of incompetency all of its own. Like that is also bad and something that people should yes. be ashamed and nervous yeah. about. Not taking credit for it is insane or the business in damage. Like if I mean, Trump wrote his names on the fucking relief checks. Like yes. even Obama, like the the infrastructure, he the investments he made, you would see like a fucking sign where like on a road. In a shitty place, they're like, this is by the, well, I forget what the bill is called. And you know what? He didn't even call it the Biden infrastructure bill. Those pussies called it the bipartisan infrastructure. It's the bisexual, <laughs> it's the bisexual <laughs> lighting infrastructure bill. So even every opportunity they have to say they're creating jobs or like impro- making sure maybe trains don't fly off the tracks every six months. Well, every that, that, they they've that. been not so successful with that recently. No, they haven't. But theoretically, <laughs> they're laying more track and they're doing this stuff. And I do think the investment is good. Obviously, Bernie would have done it better. But they're not even taking credit. They're not even doing a victory lap. They're not even I don't see signs anywhere. Uh, maybe Biden just if you, is so old timey. He thinks it's like unseemly, like a 19th century yeah, president. Yeah. How they didn't yeah, campaign it's in like the 19th century oh, or something. Right. It's yeah, like handing out turkeys or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, fair, we, we, we I, I, I simply a... couldn't take credit for those infrastructure <laughs> checks. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, I think the last time I was in Wisconsin, I saw a bunch of signs touting that, like, you know, this road was improved by the Build Back Better bill. And I guess it's just like you can point to, like, look, uh, spending any amount of money in America. OK, sure, I'll take it. And then, like, yeah. I, I guess, like, you can point to his labor department as like another like pos- a, a positive thing that you could point to about why you might consider voting for Joe Biden. But like all this is being done in the context of like the anti-infrastructure bill he's currently uh, pursuing yes. yeah, yeah. Palestine. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I just think it's like I, I, when we were talking to Ryan Grimm, I, I, I talked about how like the, the consent manufacturing factory is just so fucked up right now. The consent manufacturing machine is broken. The machine, I just want to point, consent manufacturing yeah, I mean, machine does not go burr. It didn't yeah, work. And it, like, it didn't uh, work in, in fucking like the invasion of Iraq. Like we gave, kind of gave up on the fact that anything we what what can you name like WikiLeaks like fucking Occupy like it doesn't matter what the national sentiment is. It doesn't matter. There's no semblance of like oh the 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 popular will of the people should at least influence like what what power does. They just don't even care about. They're like why would we manufacture consent? We'll just do it anyway without your, your consent. I, I think you're, I think that's correct, Amber. But like, what what I what I'm discerning right now, and like in terms of like you know how I how I view like sort of Western and Israeli propaganda to like sort of manage the public perception of this war. I think the public perception of it, they do regard that to be a big problem, whether it's like domestically, electorally for Biden or in their ability to continue prosecuting it in the way they yeah. want to. So we get today uh, reports that Israel is offering a t- uh, what they're calling up to a two month ceasefire in exchange for returning all the hostages. Because like, I mean, and then and then I just want to mention quickly the, the headline in The New York Times today in this article by David Leonhardt. The headline is the, the decline of deaths in Gaza. The daily death toll in Gaza has fallen in half over the past month, reflecting a change in war strategy. And then at the oh. very end of this article, where it just says the bottom line, the New York Times, in a not an opinion column, writes, even with the caveats, the change in Israel's war strategy has been significant and somewhat overlooked. Israel has responded to international pressure in ways that suggest its harshest critics are wrong to accuse it of wanting to maximize civilian deaths. Yet the war is yeah. not over. Israel continues to inflict enormous damage on Gaza, and Hamas continues to attack Israel and call for its destruction. The war's next phase will almost certainly include further tragedy. And my point about that is, like, <laughs> obviously, like, look, like, as many oh, people no, have pointed war, out about this war. war is going to have more tragedy? How, you yeah. don't say. <laughs> yeah, and like, to, to be fair, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, to be sure, there's more tragedy to come, but just less tragedy than you've seen on the news already. The rate of and tragedy honestly, falls over time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, I honestly what I, what I mean don't. This, also, fuck it. They're probably running out of fucking people. But yes. I, I honestly, like, think if there's... I, I, I agree with you totally about, like, they're like, ooh, this is not good PR, at least the American state. I think Israel still thinks everyone kind of likes him. And uh, I can't help it if everyone... If I'm so pretty and popular and everyone's jealous of me. I, I think if they are figuring out that they're having a bad PR thing... It's very slowly. It's the first time they've suspected it because they've been going on like a lot of their per- propaganda has just been look how great Israel is. Look how evil Hamas is. They haven't been like this is complicated. They haven't been like they haven't even really f- felt the need to defend it as much as you would think. 
right? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I, I feel like these like these pro, like what I've noticed over the last week or so is I feel like we're coming. We're like I feel like they're recycling a lot of this stuff that we were talking about two months ago. Because I mean, like, how many times has like the rapes, the rape stuff been recycled? Mm. And then last week there was this big article about um, uh, girl boss Israeli female soldiers, and they were like, killing women and children isn't just for men anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and like, they, you know, they're talking about these tank commandos, but then like it keeps coming back to this like arguments about is is Israel a settler colonial state? It keeps coming back to these buzzwords and sort of like these meta arguments. But then and now we're getting back to the idea that like the death toll is inflated in some way. But with this mm -hmm. article, what they're saying is that like, well, if you look at the data, it shows people are dying less than they used to, even though Israel has systematically destroyed <laughs> any ability to collect data on whether people are alive or dead anymore. So we're just going to assume that the death rate is falling. I what love, I, my, my point by is the like, way, I love, by the way, the idea of Israel of all places being, look, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying the numbers weren't that yeah. high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like they've, I mean, like they have systematically like seized or destroyed most of like the, you know, civil, civil service and like records of, of, you know, deeds, birth certificates, uh, uh, college degrees, et cetera, and mm -hmm. as well as, you know, destroying cemeteries as well. So it's going to be very hard to know, and I think intentionally so, how just how many people... Say what you killed. will about Nazi Germany. They could at least keep a spreadsheet. <laughs> Thank you, IBM. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is that, like, like the, the New York Times article is, like, I, I don't think the New York Times would be feel the need to write an article that absurd if they weren't seeking to kind of tamp down how abominable I think the average liberal democratic voter mm. finds what's going on right now. And they're they have a little to be bit sure on the back like, foot. And the thing is like it's not it's not so much that they're like morally opposed to killing thousands of Palestinians, but it is it, for for Biden as a politician, it is a it is a big problem for him that he keeps having to say things like we're ta we're doing everything necessary to make sure Israel complies with international law and minimizes the death of civilians and then Israel just basically just does what it wants and tells them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's like, why that's why the New York Times has to write these ridiculous articles pretending that Israel is uh, acquiescing to Biden's sort of like, you know, uh, just oh, over this the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't think Israel has any like sense of like, I don't think they know that people are mad at them. Like on some level, I, they have I think the they are no blinders I, on. I think I think they do know, but I think they I think they regard like having the entire world opinion inflamed against them is is evidence for them of how right they are because mm -hmm. I think they love thinking of how like how benighted they are and how everyone's yeah, against yeah. them and everyone hates them because they're so pretty and create so many wonderful apps like ways. <laughs> well, isn't that isn't that perhaps like you know the 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 effect of generations of internal and external propaganda that is reliant on the idea that you know, the world's hatred of Israel is so severe and so constant that we that is why we must act in the way that we do, even if that was perhaps overstated in the past yeah. for the point of propaganda. It's a fight for survival every day. That, Remember when they were talking about, like, how many, uh, like, anti-Israel states they had? And I think they named Jordan, which has, like, a one-third level child-like poverty rate. It's like, oh, no, not Jordan. But then, like, when that actually comes to pass because of objective actions the, you know it's a cry wolf situation there's no there's see, no place to you. go yeah yeah it, everyone's yeah. been saying we're a genocidal ethno state and, and, for years and, now and you know yeah and so it, if there is a genuine change in outside sentiment which there appears to be like i mean along the lines of what you guys were just talking about you know my mom who is my usual uh gauge of like the general temper temperature of the standard msnbc style uh liberal this is the most critical I've ever heard her talk about Israel. And when you've lost the mm -hmm. suburban MSNBC moms, you have something has yeah, changed. Yeah. And yeah. so if I, something I, has changed in the greater world, like there is no response to it because now the greater world is just conforming what you've been messaging about yourself. All the, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's very yeah, much I, a, like I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, Chris, I mean like for whatever it's worth, I can, I can say that that bears out as well among my, uh, among my own mother and other MSNBC watching parents that I am yeah. uh, that, are, that are close to me in my life. And I, I guess the last thing I want to say about this is like back to like the complete lack of a positive message for like this Biden reelection campaign that we all know that like Democratic partisans must be feeling pretty fucking sweaty about right now. 
Mm-hmm. They they're, they 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 can not be feeling great about this, but mm-hmm. they know that they're not going to change policy or change the, the nominee or anything. So they're they're stuck with it. So as part of the scolding and cajoling front, I, I would like to mention just like the ever more intense invocations of Donald Trump and the Republican MAGA Republican Party is like Adolf Hitler. And like mm-hmm. the idea that like if Trump wins real, if, if Trump wins this election and gets to be president for another term, <laughs> even a non-consecutive term. That mm-hmm. essentially he will end democracy in America and this will be the last election we ever had. To which I say, thank God, I'm sick of this shit. Earlier and earlier every season. It's like fucking yeah. Christmas. Uh, like, yeah, I, that's exactly, I was thinking about this yesterday. You, you like, you don't want to be relitigating the SPD KPD split 10 months before the election. <laughs> that yeah, is yeah. September, October behavior. I'm sorry. So, I mean, look, like, well, I, I certainly do not relish the thought of, you know, any Republican administration getting their fucking sausage fingers on this country for another four years or one year or even day. But the thing is, like, I don't believe you when you say this, because you can't say Trump and the Republican party are, party are like Hitler and the Fourth Reich and then be running an election against them. Why aren't you fucking arresting them? Yeah, why, yeah, why aren't you assassinating yeah. their leaders? What are you like? What are you doing yeah. here? I don't know. Like, how like do you expect me to take this threat seriously when you very clearly don't? And you have the power to do something about it. I'm just some asshole with a podcast. And, yeah, and that I your, do, your I, response to it is to yell at strangers online rather than you petition the party that you yourself declare yourself to be a, a hardcore dedicated partisan of to change its policies. Uh, reach out to people. Uh, you know uh, t- that you would yell up and try to ch- to to change from the uh, the p- a position of power rather than I don't know yeah yell, yell at strangers next to you. I mean I know that we don't actually. It's important to remember always I think that we don't actually have like parties with members that mm-hmm. pay dues in this country. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I think like there's kind of a I think the Democrats again it sounds conspiratorial. Maybe they think it would be cool to win or whatever. But at the same time, maybe they just have this backup plan where they're like, you know, it's just way easier to just be an NGO. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is just basically a prologue to me, to, to me saying the real point of today's episode. We need a beekeeper. Yeah. We need a beekeeper for tough times. We need a like beekeeper. <laughs> we need, we, we, folks, America needs a beekeeper. What we are saying is that we are looking at two, as Will has been saying, on rails, intransigent parties of equitable levels of corruption that cannot be affected from inside their own mm-hmm. party mechanics, cannot be mm-hmm. affected from inside their own membership, cannot be affected from really within society or the political culture at all. We need an outside force, an yeah. outside actor. That actor, Jason Statham. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing movie. Amazing movie. I was telling them this earlier, but at the end, my boyfriend started clapping. The entire packed theater joined in like it was f- the fucking Cannes Film Festival. So yeah, like uh, so this is sort of like sort of a hybrid episode because we did see we did see the beekeeper this weekend. A, a little birdie told me we, w- we might want to get on this because like mm-hmm. on on the on the on a surface level. How shall I describe the plot of The Beekeeper? As simply as I can describe it, basically Jason Statham plays a Jack Reacher-like character who takes it upon himself to pistol whip Pat Pepsis and the telemarketers crew because yes. they're doing scams. <laughs> yes. Because, because they are working for Hunter Biden, who in this movie is the ch- child of Hillary Clinton slash Donald Trump. It is yes. a very... Yeah. And, and like, and I, I was... I, I, I would describe this movie... This is, this is like the perfect movie to come out in January. Yeah. January mm-hmm. is the real treasure trove when studios released all their best movies. And I saw this with uh, Noah Colwyn, and I think, he, I think he described this movie correctly when he said this is a two-star banger. This is a movie that, <laughs> is not go- that is not good by any stretch of the imagination, but it is thoroughly entertaining, and it is a great movie theater mm-hmm. experience. So fun. A, a classic five-star, two-star. I, I saw this. I think the movie theater, the January movie theater experience is good. I saw this at the exact, like, there are movie theaters, different movie theaters for different situations. I saw this mm-hmm. at a local chain, not a multiplex, uh, that used to be one big-ass theater that they cut up into, like, four small ones. This appeared to be projected Ooh. onto a, a a wall painted white, like not a screen. <laughs> we get it. You're in, uh, you're in Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're all sitting yeah. on tree stumps. Yeah, it was 4 p.m. It was me uh, and Molly and, and the Wendigo. 
and yeah. he had a Wendigo and a couple who appeared to be in their late fifties or early sixties. All four of us were were doing the De Niro and Cape Fear laugh the entire time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could barely see the screen on the shitty screen. Uh, wait, great experience. Did you guys freeze? And, and like a lot of the people might you might be asking why why the beekeeper? Well, like look, obviously there is a there is a a muddled but like there is a political valence to the plot but that does not mean that this movie has a political point of view yes. which makes it like all, all the i mean like because yes. it has the veneer of what could be like a a, a, a right wing action movie because you know david ayer directed this and like mm -hmm. his career has been marked of marked by one of one lo one long prolonged act of fellatio towards law enforcement and the military <laughs> especially well, it, if they're corrupt yeah. and evil but here's why this is a perfect shuffle movie because this movie was written by the impresario, the auteur, Kurt Wimmer, director of Equilibrium. Yes. I don't mm. think this movie is as good. It's, it's not to speak the same quality as Equilibrium. But there's, it also features actor Josh Hutcherson, featured in the Morgan Freeman 60-second time travel movie that we just did with Brian. And also, just like Reversal of Fortune, it features the great Jeremy Irons playing a former CIA director. And mm -hmm. I love I love in movies when Jeremy Irons tries to do an American accent and he's like a former CIA oh. director, but like when he like he, he was trying. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah, that's the same thing with you. He, he does a hybrid Statham, Jeremy they like Irons. Cut it, yeah. They like call it out at some point, being like, "Do I talk?" Talking to Jeremy Statham, somebody saying, "Yeah, do I, do I detect a hint of the British Isles yeah. in your voice?" He's like, yeah. "Oh, how do you? Oh, yeah. yes, it, how do yeah. you uh, uh, some British Isles is hiding in your voice." Meanwhile, he's like, he's like a Dickensian chimney sweep. Also, yes. another another apolitical thing about it: there's a lot of action stars you associate with the right wing, maybe a few you associate with the left. But, you know, whatever. Chris, what's his name? You got, you got Chuck one. Norris on, on the right, and then yeah, Steven yeah. Seagal sort of but occupies Statham, this weird... Uh, Statham yeah. is unaligned. Like, Steven Seagal's movies early on were very left-wing, but now he, like, lives in, I don't know, uh, <laughs> in some former Soviet satellite state and yeah. basically only makes movies for Vladimir Putin, which, you know, I guess in, in some... In, by, if you look at it from a certain angle, it could be looked at as left-wing. <laughs> yeah. But basically, like, this... I, as much as I like Statham, this movie should have been a Steven, like a current era Steven Seagal movie. I don't know. I like the fact that he's unaligned and that, like, you know, the, the powers kind of, like, they really rode the fence, I think, in an elegant and not pussy way by making it not exactly right wing and not exactly left wing, but pro old people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Something that everybody well, can get behind. It's funny yeah. because, yeah, because there are like certain movies that, that don't have any direct political signifiers in them at all. You know, it doesn't talk about like, this has all of the present them. son. Yeah, but are nonetheless political, and this has a, you know, like every single thing is directly like the president's son is doing uh, corruption crimes, and yeah, yeah, but has almost no political takeaway. It's, but it's also, kind of the president that way. is has a completely self financed campaign that she got yes. through dirty dealing. So it's like yes. if Trump was Hunter's was mom. Hillary. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, this is like yeah, a, the president is like if Trump and Hillary got in the Brundle fly machine, and, and you just like <laughs> and, and had Hunter Biden as his son. Yes, and, and combined awesome. all the things that people find unseemly about both of them into one individual, where to the point where it's unclear what the critique is supposed to be, and that's that's what makes it perfect. I there think is, the is critique, if there is any, is that we're not nice to old people. Yes, yes. Like, I mean, if you watch daytime TV, there are two commercials all the time. One, a medication that costs a billion dollars for all these autoimmune diseases that people have now because they're miserable. Two, identity theft for old people. Yes. Because old people <laughs> always get their shit stole all the time. Yes. Well, the, also, the Statham, Statham getting on in years kind of had the Seagal thing where they don't show him. Did you watch down to the stunt doubles thing? There's like 85 stunt doubles. <laughs> like if he drank a cup of coffee, that someone was hired to do that. That man is getting on in years. Well, uh, the inciting incident for this movie, which stars Jason Statham as a beekeeper. Uh, what, what do you mean beekeeper? Well, he's a beekeeper in the very literal sense in that he keeps bees and cultivates honey. But he is also a beekeeper in the more esoteric sense, in that he is a, a member of an ultra secret government uh, a government program called Beekeepers, which essentially <laughs> empowers a jack. It's sort of like the Pope, you know, like the Dalai Lama. Yeah. A, a Jack Reacher figure is empowered by the American state to act totally autonomously of the chain of command to essentially execute, kidnap, uh, just, just do anything possible to to protect the hive. Question. 
do they all keep bees or is he, did he just <laughs> I think go, he took it really serious. Well, is no, that just Amber, like a thing that you do, like a meditational thing? Also, maybe subtle uh, old people slash environmental message. We're all so worried about the bees. Yeah. Well, I was going to say the, the inciting incident for this movie is it, as, it, as it opens, Jathan Statham is just, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a tough looking but kindly, uh, you know, beekeeper who's renting, uh, renting a barn on the large Massachusetts property of kindly old woman played by Felicia Rashad. Forgot. And she's, also good old people thing. Only real, only real uh, fucking political statement. Bill Cosby innocent. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, he's uh, he's sort of like he's and he, she's a nice old lady, and he tells her at several points in the movie, "You're the only one that's ever taken care of me, love. Just a sporty, <laughs> a sporty little honey for you, love. I've been a beekeeper my whole life. No one's ever taken care of me." So uh, he's got he's living with this guy. This, the John Wick, the the John Wick dog of this movie is Felicia Rashad, because like as, as very like within the first two minutes of the movie, like he's out in the barn making honey, he's pressing honey into jars. And then she's at home and gets a pop-up ad on her laptop, which is just like, oh, like, you know, or oh, malware detected, like, please call this number. She gets fished. And she calls basically the headquarters of telemarketers. What we do is we call up people and chisel them out of money. Like Sam Lippenstern mm -hmm. is there, <laughs> Pat Pepsis. Yeah, and they just awesome. they clean they just clear out her bank. They they get her to like install a program and give her give the like routing numbers or whatever, and they just empty out her checking accounts. And I'm like, Oh man, like I hope Jason Statham get this money back for her. Nope, she kills herself dead in the next scene. Just immediately. It's a weird, it's a weird like the set. Can we talk about the setting of like the call center? It's like a weird kind of club style atmosphere yeah. call center where all the guys are like hype beast Matthew Lescos and like yes. they're all like cheering and like do there's like it kind of has the energy of um of the of the telemarketers in telemarketers in the documentary. Yeah. It's like if these like high the pressure sales environment where they're always putting up your your total on the mm -hmm. big screen, yeah, yeah, boiler room, but with like vibe lighting. Yeah, it's kind of lit like a bottle service, the bottle service <laughs> section of a club. Uh, I, I do want to shout out the first guy who plays the the head of the initial call center, uh, David Witz. Very good uh, sleaze bag performance by this first guy. Mm -hmm. He's later upstaged by Josh Hutcherson, but two, two, uh, you, you love a good sleaze bag. Oh yeah! Uh, in, in the scene with the first call center guy, he takes out like they they come to his barn and he's got some hitters with him, and they blow up his 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 bee his bee boxes. I don't know. I don't know what they're called. There's the, the bee boxes. They're hives. They're literally called yeah, hives. The hives. <laughs> yeah, they they shoot it up and they think they're gonna fuck this guy up, and then like there's a scene where Statham goes in the barn and, the, and then just starts a band saw, and I'm like, ooh, I wonder what's gonna happen with that. And then like five How do minutes they later, even know they're his bees, though? <laughs> like, if they're on a farm. Uh, I think at some point he's like, he, he tells them, he's like, I'm the fucking beekeeper. Oh, maybe right. Him. He you've been, you've been, he basically been, you've been, tells, it, it. tells every person he encounters in the movie that he is the beekeeper. That's true. That's his main line. You're right. I missed that part. I was too transfixed by, uh, by the good bad guys. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, uh, and, and then from there, he just, he attempts to follow the money up, up, to, which leads him to a, a, a giant tech company that's just like runs hundreds of these like telemarketing, uh, sort of boiler rooms that just like steal money from retirees who don't have like living relatives or anyone to care about them. And they just empty out their bank accounts and use it to fund the presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton slash Donald <laughs> Trump. But Hunter Biden, like his, not his boss so much, but like his, his handler, like the person in, installed in the company to keep an eye on him, is mm -hmm. played by Jeremy Irons, who plays a former CIA director who at one point like, get, gets a bunch of like mercenary ex-Navy SEALs and Green Berets, and he's just like, and this, this is my impression of Jeremy Irons doing an American accent. You boys are all Navy SEALs or Green Berets. <laughs> compared to a beekeeper, that means you're pussies. You're nothing compared to the, uh, he's doing the, the the thing that like so okay so now be, because basically all male Hollywood actors are British or Australian guys they've gotten yeah. pretty good at doing American accents but he's Not doing Jeremy. the thing that like Not older him. older British guys do and it's like when the Monty Python guys ever had to pre pretend to be Americans they would just insert superfluous R's in yeah. their words so it's like yeah. I'm Americaner. I am ordering a hamburger. Extra vowels and diphthongs. Yeah. Everything kind of goes, yeah. Yeah. And like he, he keeps, and like Jeremy Irons' character is the one that is um, tasked with 
repeatedly explaining what beekeepers are to all the other characters in the movie. And he's just like, I'm sorry, son. A beekeeper has marked you for death, which means you have approximately five minutes to live. If you've heard of a beekeeper, you're already dead. So did he used to fuck the president? Did anybody else pick up on that? Am I just, am I just assuming that? Am I, am I picking up on sexual tension that isn't there? But I feel like he used to fuck the president. (laughs) <laughs> yes no yeah definitely okay definitely. i'm just making sure no no you were you, like, you, you did not for a reason you, yeah because he was like oh you still think about me and she was just, mm, <laughs> sometimes so yeah like maybe in the ire cut it, it it's shown that uh josh hutcherson is a, actually jeremy irons son and that's why he <laughs> yeah, takes yeah, such special yeah. care i just i just wanted to make sure because i'm like that's an insane detail that didn't need to be there at all <laughs> I will say, though, I mean, I, I, a few criticisms I have of this movie. Uh, chief among them is that the worst thing that happens to Jeremy Irons in this movie is that Statham breaks his finger and just sits him down. And he's like, ow, that's it. <laughs> that's it. What? And, you know, and, and also at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, uh, the beekeeper um, kills the son of the president because in beekeeper myth, in the beekeeper mythos, sometimes when bees when their queen produces defective male offspring, a queen slayer has to arise and the bees have to kill the queen. So when but they it, started explaining this, I was like, oh, Jay, uh, the beekeeper is going to assassinate the president. This is yes. going to be awesome. It's not called the fail son slayer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, he does not. He does not kill the president at the end of this movie, which I was somewhat disappointed in. Might have been he, a little too political. They probably wrote it that way originally. And then they're like, reel it back. Make it a commercial. You can't, for identity you can't protection. kill the president. Yeah, don't doesn't matter which one it is, don't do it. People in the in this day and age, people might get ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, the pre- any any relative of the president, hey, it's open yeah, season. It's, it's, oh. B, it's B season. But why does it happen at a party? <laughs> the party the seems most, the end was so weird. The most nonsensical thing. I mean, do you guys want to just like skip around and like hit things from because there's so many funny details yeah. in this. Yeah. I, I, the party scene in the end where it's like, okay, the president and her son are going to be at a party where it's like strippers doing House of Yes style carnival, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like sexy carnival stuff with like, you know, like club guys in shiny suits, but also like heads of state are there. Yeah, it was like a oh, Cirque and, du Soleil, and- but like there was a guy that I don't know if you clocked this guy, but he looked like Jocelyn Wildenstein. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, they get to the fucking bad guy. Well, we'll get to that later. Well, no, Chris, I had the exact same thought because like towards the end of the movie, Jeremy Irons gets the brilliant idea to be like, okay, how am I going to save this dipshit fail son's life? He's been marked for death by a beekeeper heretofore every every wave after wave of like mafia guys and Navy SEALs. He sent them all home in body bags. So he's like, aha, okay, let's go to your mother's like Martha's Vineyard retreat. And because she's the president, the sort of cordon of security provided by the Secret Service will prevent the beekeeper from his bee queen slaying uh, duties from keeping the bees. But <laughs> yeah, but so like, you know, the, when the president travels somewhere, like obviously like there's a lot of media, you know, like, there's a Secret Service. But like th- this party scene is so odd because like the, the son and Jeremy Irons also conspire to have basically a hit squad of like cartel fucking gun gun guys just show up at a party with the secret service and they're all heavily armed. And there's this insane South African guy carrying an Uzi being like, where's the beekeeper mate? I'm going to kill this cocksucker. Yeah. And it's just like, and I don't then, think the secret the way, service guy, would. He is That guy is British. He, the guy, he looks like Matt Gates, And then he's like actually British. He like with spent like shops. six yeah. years. Yeah. And I don't like his face. He has horrible Matt Gates face it upsets me but he I, yeah, I think he's cool six, I think he's good for a sleazy mercenary he spent six years as, he was in South Africa until he was six and then they just forever hire him I don't know because I looked up I'm like who is this guy he needs to be the ugly scary guy and everything yeah but no he's a Nathan J Robinson of South Africa so it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's got like every possible uh South African effect yeah he's awesome he's so gross I do. Li- I also like just like details in, especially in this party scene towards the end and like the last 20 minutes of this movie, every shot of the Hunter Biden character, the, the Josh Hutcherson guy, he is consuming a different substance. And often within <laughs> the same sequence of scenes, it'll be like shot one. He's drinking a whiskey, cut, cuts to his mom, cuts back to him. He's snorting a line, cuts back, back to his mom, cuts back to, to him. He's ripping up a, a, a DMT, complicated a DMT vape, vape yeah, pen. Yeah. Yeah, it just like, I, like, he has multiple types of vape, if I remember yes. correctly. 
Uh, it's a it's a really nice touch of of <laughs> you know with it, breaking continuity to just shove different substances in this person. Oh, we forgot that the fucking FBI lady once again old people shit. Uh, J. C. Stathy he takes care of Felicia Rashad, but her her completely uh, ungrateful daughter has been yeah. ignoring her this whole time. Again, it's old people movie. To be, well, she, yeah, her daughter has been an FBI agent, so she hasn't been, you know, explaining to her about that you shouldn't uh, pick up your phone when it's someone a number you don't recognize, <laughs> or respond to emails saying that you've been hacked, or kill yourself the first time you see <laughs> yeah. a fucking bank. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. She also ever, like got messages ever, from the yes, it's a fraud alert. Like, it hey, was a fraud alert. They <laughs> have to give do. it back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. The bank says there's been an error against my favor. Well, I better put this revolver in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, you get, well, you, get, oh, you get hit with an overdraft charge. and You're like, well, I guess that's it for me. I'm going to the bridge and taking a dive off. Um, but uh, but uh, OK, it, here's another another part that I remember from the movie is when Jason Statham is talking to the FBI, the now, you know, uh, the, the FBI agent whose mother just committed suicide because the telemarketers <laughs> called her up and it's all it said we're asking you to donate now for officers killed in the line of duty <laughs> she, she wanted that sticker for her car so bad yes. but you know that's then she ended up dead for it but uh statham in like and what i think is this movie's only actual like uh, point of view or like our articulated <laughs> an articulated point of view the only thing that exists in this movie is when statham explains that those who steal from the elderly are in fact worse than those who steal from children because mm -hmm. like children, the elderly are also stupid and helpless, but there's even, <laughs> but, but there's actually, but there's no adults to look out for them. Whereas yes. kids are, yes. are dumb babies, but they have adults in their life to be like, Hey, don't exactly. Do I agree. I agree I know. with that uh. point. I think that they should have to take a test every three months if they want to keep driving. Like I do think it's, there's a huge, it's a huge sin to rip them off. You steal candy from a baby. That baby's going to get more candy later. <laughs> <laughs> that baby has 80 years of opportunities to get candy. Yes. You steal candy from a 70 year old. They're on their last, their last round of candies. Yes. It's, it's so awful. And I think the people watching, I think again, I think it's targeted at the elderly. I think they would be like, yes, we are stupid. We don't know what's going on. Please take care of us. Yes. I mean, we've talked about a lot over the course of the show about how much of like current politics is, you know, basically agreeing to the third Reich if it'll make your your nephew or granddaughter email you i think that if, if there is a political fantasy here it's that the fantasy of having a super son or daughter who supersedes <laughs> yeah, your yeah. lazy son and daughter and will yes. not only call you back but will in fact kill for you and yeah, will not only give you a also, jar you of fresh all, honey and you got and you get all the the petulant you know like the revenge suicide of be like i'll show them and you get to die and make them feel guilty and you get to be avenged. You get to yes. go out on your own terms, but also have some spite towards your ungrateful children. See, this is actually making a lot of sense because, again, when I sat down in the theater, the only two other people there were like in their mid 60s. I was like, oh, are they going to like this? And then as we were all walking out, there was like, that was great. And I was like, now now I'm like, yeah, I see where they got to get from this. It's it's old coded. Yes. You know, but, but, but like it, it's channeling the. The undirected but vague sense of sort of populist anger that we have. We just we just want Jack Reacher to hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. we, want, yes. we want him to hurt yeah, somebody. Yeah. We don't really know why. Not the president. You know, the president, they're doing their best. But the president's kid. Yeah. Obviously yeah. Jack Reacher can crush his head like a fucking melon. Yeah. That ungrateful little shit again. Like, it's yeah. just another ungrateful little shit. And the president, you don't like them, but you don't want to upset the apple cart too much. But you want you want that little brat punished. It's all yeah. elder fantasy. Yeah. And I mean, like the Republicans have been trying to like hump the Hunter Biden story into some kind of lasting or, or deep significance, the entire Biden presidency. And I mean, I get it because it's so funny. tawdry and tantalizing and funny and you hope that there's something there. But I, and I think that, you know, they are always trying to, to attack it from the most lewd angles, the drugs, the prostitute. But I think if they really wanted to do it, it's like, Look at how ungrateful this kid is. Yeah, his yeah. father gave him everything, and he yeah. just threw it away. Doesn't that piss you off? His dad learned to text just to communicate with him, and he leaves his dad on red. Yes, uh, I have a few a few other mild critiques of this movie. Number one, I was really expecting him to um, 
kill people in ways that that incorporated bees, bees yes. in some way. Yeah, I was I was hoping true. that like, he would like you know bury someone in the sand, cover their head with honey, and have bees like <laughs> make a make a hive out of their skull. I mean, at one point, at That's one point, true. he 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 smashes a glass a jar of honey over the current beekeeper, who's some like rave chick who has a gat a mini gun on the back of a pickup truck in Massachusetts. I about her. Yeah, yeah I she, have a, okay. she was beekeeper. fun. I wish I, I wish we saw more of her. This so is my so biggest he, critique with this movie yeah. is a structural one, which is okay. So the beekeeper starts his revenge path and like kills a bo- a bunch of goons, and then th- you see the first Jeremy Irons scene where he's like, "There is a beekeeper a- after you, a hundred <laughs> hundred Biden." <laughs> And like, like, if you're listening to this need, episode, to this is not an exaggeration you. how many times the phrase bees and beekeeper, beekeeper is said. It's probably <laughs> and so no you less than 60 like, times. The rational structure of something like this was like, okay, you start with goons. Then maybe you move to mob guys to try to take them out. Mm-hmm. Then Delta Force. Then you're Afrikaners. And then the final thing, the <laughs> final, final fight. Is, you do a boar war. <laughs> the final, the final, fight, like the final fight should be another beekeeper. The yeah. only thing that can yeah. defeat a beekeeper yeah. should be another beekeeper. Absolutely. No, it's like, and it should have been like, that chick. She was fun. Yeah. She, she had all crazy eyes. She looked like she was in the uh, the rave episode of Samurai Jack. She was yeah, like it's a like, fun throwback. <laughs> it's like fifteen minutes into the into the movie, they're like, okay, there's a beekeeper. What do you do? Call another beekeeper. They go in. He dispatches her in two minutes. On the next her thing, instantly, it instantly. Yeah, it is the, no... Everyone else is supposed to be a pussy. She, yeah. They're supposed to be the top. They're really undermining their. But it's a, a so huge right. structural flaw of the movie. I mean, like, so basically, right. when when, St- when Statham retired as beekeeper, there was a big drop off in beekeeper quality. Yes, <laughs> and I, and like there's just like there's so many things like that that are just never followed up in this movie, which I really appreciated, and I have to credit the filmmakers because like yeah. in, in most other movies there would be like okay. Do you remember the fact that Minnie Driver was in this movie for about yeah, two for like seconds? A second. And she's like the third bill lead on the credits. She is in two scenes in this movie and her character never comes back or plays mm-hmm. any role in the plot whatsoever. She she's just a plays- tiny second. Very, very big actress. Also, I had a I had a weird, is that Minnie Driver? Did she get like a masseter reduction? I had to think like three times, is that Minnie Driver? She looks weird, right? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I barely recognize I mean, her. I mean, no, she's she's still mini to me. She's still, she's still mini to me, and she's, she's still, still gross point blank to me. She's but still I have like, like I know it you know, can't the heartthrob of every '90s indie have, kid. Yeah, I was like, no, it can't be mini driver because she would get more screen time. But no, <laughs> yeah. it's her. No, like she had she had she had no scenes. She had scenes talking on the phone with Jeremy Irons, and that's it. And wearing you know, no, a really cool one, like just straight up, like off the shoulder, elegant dress that looked like a perfume commercial for like a second. Uh, but my my biggest critique of this movie was. Towards the end, one of the best scenes in the movie, like just absolutely perfect action movie writing. When the Afrikaner mercenary has like Jason, he has the beekeeper on his knees and he has a gun to his head and he's like, I'm going to fucking kill you. You're like, you're a black or something like that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. And then and like the, the Afrikaner mercenary is like, you are so a hard beekeeper man. But it's like they say to be or not to be. And then Statham goes, <laughs> I'll take to be. And you know what? Like, I just there are so many there are so many opportunities there. Where he yeah. said, like, how about Plan B, or yeah. <laughs> you know, like there's something there. They could have spent right a little back. more time. I don't know. On it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just going. Well, I'll be, and then he unleashes the bees. <laughs> letter, letter B. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, like, uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, a solid, entertaining movie. Not enough bees from for my like to, to really cook, kick it into like a masterpiece. I would need I would need more bees in this movie. But you know what? I'm hoping like look, there is definitely the door open for a sequel, and uh, and, and it could be called Two B. Two B, yes. Two B. Two. They blew their water on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Two B would be good, but I'm I'm thinking like we need an update of the beekeeper, and like now that he's a retired beekeeper that's still doing beekeeping activities, keeping the hive safe and whatnot. I think he needs to take it to the next level. The next movie should be called The Zookeeper with Jason Statham, mm. and essentially like now he is um, tasked with arresting like malefactors of great wealth, like people who steal from the elderly or you know do telemarketing. <laughs> he just makes <laughs> a one man more on fundraising. The real evil do- doers. Yeah, but but instead of um, just killing them. He like he basically um, incarcerates them in his human zoo, and he becomes the zookeeper. And it's just like you wake up and you're in like a shipping container with like a cot, and it's like you're part of the fucking zoo now, mate. You should just stop stealing from the elderly. So that, that's my pitch for for beekeeper two, zookeeper. Yeah, uh, you know our number, Hollywood. Yeah, I I would just say 
You know, I was I was thinking a lot about Lady Ballers when we were watching this and how like god awful the the overt attempts to create conservative political comedy is. And I think that, you know, if you're an aspiring like media writer, TV or film writer, I think this is a good thing to write because I, I would say if you want to write something with political like a quote unquote political movie or political valence, the two things that you should ch- challenge yourself to do is write something with either zero political signifiers Mm -hmm. that nonetheless has a political message or where it's literally about murdering Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, but (laughs) has no political content in it whatsoever. It has all all the, yeah, all the political signifiers are in this movie with no political statement. It's really fun. I think that that is, I think you will end up with something good, at least entertaining from that because it's like, you know, it's, it's all callback. You know, we love, we love to see our guys that we see in the news and we love to fantasize about what if Jason Statham, like strangled them with a <laughs> telephone cable or something. Yeah. Oh, there's Statham a really great sequence with Jason, <laughs> Jason Statham punching a guy in the neck with a phone, like an office phone, oh, uh, so cool. like a uh, terminal. Uh, yeah. My, my, per- my personal thing that I'd like to see Jason Statham in a movie, in a fantasy, not reality due to let's say, I don't know some of the people we've been talking about is there's a scene where he uh, he uh, comes around the back of a guy holding a shotgun, grabs the barrel and pulls the shotgun into this dude's mouth and then smashes yes. all his teeth with the shotgun in his mouth. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of movie. him just disarming guys with guns, taking the guns apart in front of them and then beating the guys with the parts of the gun. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I know I've said it already, but like all the scenes where he just fucks up telemarketing boiler rooms all I can think yes. of is just poor Pat Pepsis like nodding out at his desk and then the fucking and Jason the transporter comes in and just over him. smashes his head through a computer screen <laughs> no, we, we love Pat we love Sam but I, I just couldn't help but think yeah. of the, the unmitigated violence that would have been unleashed at like you know <laughs> New Jersey Civic Trust Group or whatever they're working for <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm uh, sure they'd get a kick out of this I look I, I, I we were just talking about like the sort of like the interesting exercise of creating a movie with every political signifier, but no political point of view. And I just wanted to contrast that with, uh, th- this is just something I read. Uh, I just saw this right before we started reporting, uh, started recording today. And this is in the Hollywood reporter, uh, about, um, Ava DuVernay's new movie cast, which is based on a book of the same title, which is like, I, I don't know much about the book. It's by Isabel Wilkerson. And I think it like attempts to transpose the Indian caste system onto American, uh, racism or whatever. I vaguely remember I, when this came out and it being like a deal. It was a bit were much touted. It's book. an Oprah book. It's literally yeah. an Oprah's yeah. Choice book. And so it's like, also been, just it seems to be I can't I kinda want to read it now because it does seem to be like uh slavery, the Holocaust, someone calling you fat at the bus stop. They're kinda all the same thing. It has a very <laughs> has a very avid DuVernay did like ayahuasca and had kind of a like, I see everything that's connected now. Can see the I want to read the zeros, book. Yeah. yeah I, I want to read the I book. I want to watch the movie. We I think I saw on somebody re- re- refer to it as like Cloud Atlas for racism or the 1619 <laughs> project. Well, I mean, I, 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 w- I wasn't aware of the really aware of this movie, but I certainly want to see it now after reading this in The Hollywood Reporter. I'm just going to share this like as, as contrast to The Beekeeper. Origin returns to Martin at the end of its in, returns to Martin, meaning Trayvon Martin, at the end in a juxtaposition suggested by one of Duvernay's close friends, Guillermo del Toro. He was one of our <laughs> biggest champions, and he came in and edited with us for a couple of days. Says Averick, it was his idea to flash Trayvon Martin within the concentration camp scene. He was like, <laughs> "There's some kind of connection." When they put the clips <laughs> up against each other, the impact was stunning. In the Holocaust sequence, a Jewish woman desperately tries to run after her son as they are ripped away from each other. Nazi officials wrestle with her to the ground and put a gun to her head. Echoed decades later by Zimmerman wrestling Martin to the ground. Even the composition of the footage was coincidentally similar. I just love the idea of Guillermo del Toro being like, <laughs> I, love, I love my monsters. I, only mon- I love monsters so George much. George Zimmerman. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what if George Zimmerman was a mothman? What if he was Frankenstein? <laughs> what is probably like what greater monster is there? But I mean, you guys laugh, but like those are all bad things. Yeah, and if that's not a connection. I don't know. I, what th- it is. I just like I think there's I think there's some connection here. But like I we were just like I was I, I saw this right before we started recording today, and like Amber, to your point about like. The, bee, the beekeeper having no message despite like all the things that seem like there's going to be a message. Whereas this is like nothing but message, yeah. just yeah. message, message. And I'm, I'm fascinated. I really do want to see this movie now because it sounds, yeah. uh, I mean, a really heavy handed political <laughs> yeah. allegory can be very entertaining. 
Yeah, especially when it's so ham-fisted that it thinks all of the bad things are the same thing. Because yeah. you had some sort of like, you know, smoke sweet once. I have found the unifying theory of the world movement. Um, Just as, I, I, like, I, I when everything this, has to be every message. Ed DeVernay said something like, um, to the effect of, and I'm probably butchering it, uh, I think people should focus more on what I say and less on how I say it. And I'm like, yeah, that was movies. that was in a New Yorker profile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You make movies. I, I and I don't know, was this not the longest, sorry, was this not the longest Hollywood reporter article you have ever read in your life? I well, I mean, I only saw the clip about, about Guillermo del Toro being like, we need some Trayvon in this Holocaust scene. <laughs> Yo, editor, can you uh, can you dial up the Trayvon slider just a bit? <laughs> she said they didn't hire actors for the for the low cast for the, like Gala, I think it is They're the low cast people. And my first thought was like, did she pay them? Like, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they so did. Cheap. I'm sure they paid all the actors. <laughs> I'm sure they paid all the actors. That's the thing she said. They movie. weren't actors. <laughs> I don't know. I just I, well, I, I I look forward to reading the book and seeing and seeing how yeah. everything is all connected. Uh, well, uh, let's let's wrap it up there for today, gang. Um, we'll be back on Thursday, but that was uh, just the the end of the end of Rhonda and the beginning of the beekeep the beekeeping era. Mm -hmm. the, we we must keep the bees. Uh, yeah. I, I have two quick announcements first, because I, as we were talking at the beginning that I produce, even in my dreams, I have to mention that it is in fact, episode 800 of Chapa Trap House. Woo! Uh, Woo! always loved to crack off another hundo. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, the eight hundreds will be the beekeeping saga. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is our beekeeping era. Yes. We so will, we, so we will to, be uh, that outside force to, 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 re to, to, rebalancing the, the hive. To hit a milestone, but I think like the next really big milestone, which we should do like a, a, a like maybe even a, a gala a live event, a special, some sort of 24 hour marathon, the thousandth episode. Th that is when we will produce our we'll, we'll do our the Chapo Cruise uh, where we all uh, engage in like cancelable behavior with the fans. And that guy on on YouTube has to do a like what went wrong with the Chapo Cruise video. <laughs> 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 I think it would be great. I think it'd be like Sea Org. <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. read, the, read the Terry Southern novel, The Magic Christian, to find out what the Chapo Cruz will be like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, as I mentioned last week, I am going to be appearing at the um, San Francisco Sketch Fest this Wednesday uh, with the Talking Simpsons podcast. Uh, shout out Henry and Bob. That. Yeah, shout out Henry and Bob. We love them. Uh, and we'll be doing Marge vs. the Monorail. Uh, I'm going to be reciting, um, even though it's very tangentially related, I will be reciting um, Trouble from Music Man in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, details for that, I think it's at 7.30 at the Gateway Theater, I think it is, uh, but details for that will be into the description. Hopefully see you there. All right. Okay. Well, we'll be back on Thursday.